All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cedar Crest College Education Department virtual lecture and book reading with famed children's book author Vanessa Brantley Newton. Before we get started this evening, I'd like to first review a few tech tips so you'll know how to participate in tonight's event. We ask that you please keep your microphone and video muted during the session and type your questions in the chat. If you need to leave during the session, you can always join back live or view a recording that we'll be sharing later. If we experience any technical difficulties or lose connection, we'll return as soon as we're able, and we ask that you please rejoin the session through the same link. And then if you experience technical difficulties, you can visit support.zoom.us and utilize the instant chat to get help from a Zoom professional. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Melissa Kamyab, our event organizer. Dr. Kamyab teaches educational research, reading methodology, as well as secondary methods and assessment courses here at Cedar Crest, while also serving as a director of the graduate education program. So thank you for bringing us all together tonight, Dr. Kamyab. Thank you, Deb. And on behalf of the education department here at Cedar Crest College, welcome to our evening with Vanessa Brantley Newton. Vanessa was born during the civil rights movement and attended school in Newark, New Jersey. Being part of a diverse, tight knit community during such turbulent times, Vanessa learned the importance of acceptance and empowerment in shaping a young person's life. When she read Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats, it was the first time she saw herself in a children's book. It was a defining moment in her life and has made her into the artist she is today. As an illustrator, she includes children of all ethnic backgrounds in her stories and artwork. She wants all children to see their unique experiences reflected in the books they read so they can feel the same sense of empowerment and recognition she experienced as a young reader. Vanessa celebrates self-love and acceptance of all culture through her work and hopes to inspire young readers to find their own voices. When she's not drawing and crafting, Vanessa travels the country visiting schools and libraries to spread the word about intentional illustration, letting every child know that they're in her books. Vanessa is making a difference in the world and it, she's making it a better place with her stories, her artwork and her books. It is my pleasure to introduce our friend and fellow book lover, Vanessa Brantley Newton. Hello everyone. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, it is my joy to be here with all of you. I hope that all, you are all safe and that uh, it has not been too bad uh, for you all during the COVID season of our lives right now. It just feels like we're at war <laughs> and um, it's very strange times that we're living in, but um, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that you are doing well and making your way through this. So uh, it is just great to be here and uh, I'm gonna talk to you all about uh, diversity. So just let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, I am uh, a Newark raised child, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, we call it Brick City. And uh, my mom and dad uh, were hardworking people who worked sometimes two and three and sometimes four jobs to take care of my little sister and I. And uh, we were the first black family or the second black family rather to move into an all white neighborhood. And uh, the people in the neighborhood let us know that they did not want us there. And driving up the street every day, my father would come driving up the street in his beautiful black Cadillac that he purchased with cash at 25 years old. And he would drive that car up and every day for a whole month, the police would pull him over every day. And they would call him out of his name and they would scare my sister and I to the point where we had a trauma done to us. And uh, it was horrible. It was nothing short of disastrous uh, for me as a child. Um, we were uh, raised with to love people, basically. So to tell you a little bit about my family, my mom um, and my father 
uh, came from a small town in South Carolina called Hampton County, South Carolina. And in Hampton, all of my relatives, every other person was my relative. It was that tiny. And they were sharecroppers. And my mom actually was a midwife. My mother would go to school all day long at 16 years old, come home in the evening and deliver babies all night long. And if the mothers couldn't give birth that night or whatever, she'd have to stay out of school to make sure that that mom would bring that baby home or that baby was gonna be born safely. And it was a time, like I said, during the 1950s and 60s where you know black people weren't invited to white people's homes. But my mom being a midwife would go to everybody's house to help them to deliver babies. She and my great grandmother, that's what they would do together. My mother would literally ride in a wagon with her grandmother to who, whomever's house it was. And she would help deliver children. And uh, it was uh, you know, very, very hard for them when they came from South Carolina to move into uh, New York where it was totally different from being in South Carolina. Now they're in New Jersey and New York, going to school, going to work. They decided to get married, have me and my sister right in the middle of the civil rights movement. They were singers. Uh, they did background for a woman named Shirley Caesar and the Caesarettes. My mom and dad would travel the country singing. Um, they did sit-ins. Uh, they were people who had a big heart. And I'm telling you this because we had a very, very diverse household. So my father's boss, Mr. Feinberg, would often come to our house and he would talk with my father and they would sit and they would chat. My mother's boss, who was uh, Mrs. Kina, and Mrs. Kina was Italian. The first time I ever had an Italian hamburger, it was at Miss Kina's house. And then there were other people that my mother friended, Muslim, uh, Christian, Jewish. I learned about Shabbat. From, from so many of my mother's Jewish friends, Miss Shirley, uh, that taught my mother about what Shabbat was all about. And I was exposed to every kind of person. Uh, my mother wore a lot of wigs. And in Newark, there used to be this awesome hair shop where she could go and she could have her wigs kind of tailored. My mother liked, uh, loved to party. She and my father, they liked to go to nice little parties and things like that. And she would get her hair done as far as wigs were concerned. And there was this awesome guy named Tony. And Tony was the first um, uh, transvestite that I ever met in my whole entire life. And I loved Tony. Tony wore this long, long uh, uh, ponytail and he would do my mother's hair. And they would talk about makeup and they would talk about hair and they would talk about hats. And it was awesome seeing the relationship. Uh, if you were gay, my mother and father took you into our home. Perhaps your mother and father put you out or you were cut off in society. You came and you stayed with us. Uh, if you were an African student traveling and you couldn't find anywhere else to stay, my mother would bring you home to our house. Uh, in our community, uh, there were sometimes veterans from uh, Vietnam who were on the street, shell-shocked, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, so bad that they couldn't function anymore. And my mother would literally take our van, she would drive into the neighborhood, she would pick them up off the street, pick them up off the street now. Uh, some of them would follow the van in their little carts with all their possessions in them. And I'm talking white, I'm talking black, Hispanic, you name it. And they would come to our house and my mother would literally make a full spread dinner for them, take all of their clothes out of their carts, wash them, and our, wash them, literally, would take clothes out of my father's closet, give to them, feed them, would pray with them because she was a minister. She would pray with them. She would put money in their hands, make them extra sandwiches to take with them back on the street. And I remember one day she brought home somebody and I was very upset as a teenager. Oh, mommy, how could you bring this person into our home? And she let me have a message that I still remember this day. And it was that everybody deserves dignity, everybody. 
it changed my life. It literally changed my life. It gave me a heart towards people that I am today loving people. I just enjoy people. Um, until you show me something different, I'm friends with you. <laughs> it's just the way I travel when I move through life. I love people. Uh, diversity was something, like I said, that was shown to me at an early age. And it has changed me in ways that I can't even begin to uh, express because I care deeply for people. I feel people at the root of me. Um, I worked in a hospital for 25 years as a uh, phlebotomist. Um, you see, when you come home and you tell your mother and father as an African-American that you want to be a artist, yeah, that don't compute. It don't work, it ain't cute, it ain't fun. Um, you're not living with us forever, that's for sure. So you need to find a full-time job because uh, being an artist, that ain't, mm -mm, it don't compute, it ain't cute, it, we ain't, no, mm, sweetie, we don't appreciate that. Go get a job, be a teacher, um, be a nurse, anything but tell me you want to be Picasso. Who the hell is Picasso? We ain't never seen one. So this is what you, this is what you gonna do? Oh, okay. And um, so my mother and father were not happy. And I remember the day that I got up and I went to the kitchen and I drew on the side of the kitchen stove with all of my Crayola crayons. And I jumped back and I said, I'm an artist. And they were like, no, you're not. You a janitor, you gonna clean all this up. And so my first job, I was a janitor. And I always found another place to put those pictures. So I would go in my room because that's where I was banished to. I would go in my room and I would draw on the baseboard in the closet. And I'd put all my drawings in the bottom of the baseboard. And I would talk to them because my mom and dad really didn't have time with all the jobs they had to tell me stories. So I had to tell my own self stories. And so I would just draw and draw and draw. Now, going to school, uh, it got crushed for me very early on. Went to an all white school. I was the only black child in the school. I remember to this day, my mother dressed me in a plaid, uh, it was a plaid, blue, white, green, and gold uh, pinafore with a crisp white uh, Peter Pan collared shirt. And I had on Buster Brown. Some of you guys are too young to know what Buster Browns are. But I had on my Buster Browns, which were really beautiful red, penny red shoes and my church socks, I called them because they had lace around them. And I remember walking into the classroom and I remember the air being thick with, I don't want her here. The children looked at me like, who is this person that just walked into this classroom? And the teacher let my mom and dad know and she let me know right away, I do not want this black child in my class. And my mother and father, they left me because they had to go to work, of course, they couldn't stay with me. And the teacher said something to me that scared me so bad that literally <laughs> it made school for me just go completely downhill. When I tell you completely downhill, um, first of all, I am dyslexic. I also have something called synesthesia, which is the ability to see, smell, feel, taste, and hear color. Yeah, imagine that. And I also stutter. Uh, now, you're probably wondering, why isn't she stuttering now? Because there is something that I've learned over the years. Um, as I shared with you just a little bit, my mother and father were both musicians. Uh, my mother was a stutterer as well. My mom taught me that if I sang, I wouldn't stutter. And so I sang. And so this teacher says to me in the class, uh, did you have breakfast this morning? And I told her, I said, no, ma'am. And she said, um, well, you're going to eat this oatmeal. And she slides the bowl in front of me because she didn't want to touch me. Slides the bowl in front of me. And uh, she says, you better eat it. And I kind of looked and because the oatmeal didn't have the things that I usually have at home, my mom usually put cinnamon on it. She'd put some butter on it, some carnation sweet milk on top of it, you know, and give it a good stir, you know, uh, that wasn't it. And she told me that if I didn't eat it, 
she was going to stick my head in the fish tank that was in the room. It scared me so bad, I didn't even go home and tell my mother and father. Because back in those days, if the teacher said that something was wrong, uh, it didn't matter. Uh, your mom and dad was going to spank you anyway. And it was a slavery mindset because back in the day, during slavery time uh, for black people, uh, when the master saw a good slave uh, that was beautiful or had nice teeth or was strong, uh, they would make compliments. He's strong, he looks good or she's beautiful. She, she, she looks like she can bear children or whatever. The parents would often say, no, no, master, she, she dumb, she's stupid, she don't know, no better. She, mm, she would not make a good slave. And it was not because it wasn't true, it was, it, or, or that it was true what they were saying. They said it because they didn't want their families to be separated and sold. Does that make sense? And so this is kind of what the attitude of my parents or what I had is I didn't wanna go home and tell my mother and father, the teacher said this to me. So I never said anything to them. And unfortunately, my school career after that just went completely downhill. I failed from probably the fifth grade through high school, failed completely. Uh, me and my husband just moved into a temporary new house as our house is being built. And I went through a box and I looked into the box and I pulled out my report cards. And there were so many F's and D's on my report card that I'm still sitting here in wonderment, like how the hell did I get through school? How did I get through? Being dyslexic, being black and dyslexic, uh, not having an advocate, not having anybody to stand in the gap for me. Uh, my parents not understanding how to stand in the gap for me, but uh, showing me still the gift of diversity. Uh, that uh, I could do whatever I needed to do was not shown to me by my parents, but shown to me by some of my teachers as I got older. I had uh, two wonderful teachers um, who looked at my work one day and said, this girl has talent. She really has talent. And they stood in the gap for me. When I took my SATs, my SATs were so low, they were under 400. They say you get 300 just for showing up. And these two teachers went to FIT and talked to the staff at FIT and said, listen, she doesn't test well because she doesn't do good at tests. But if you just talk to her, and I'll never forget Mr. Snall and Miss D taking me under their arm as if I were their own child and sitting in the offices with me at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, and talking to the staff and saying, just let her draw, just let her draw. And I sat there and I drew pictures that got me into FIT. It was the best thing that had ever happened to me. It was the first time I ever felt cared for by teachers but uh, it, it transformed me. Um, it even showed me more diversity in how you can be loved by people that did not share your skin, did not share your experience, um, not even really your culture, but could embrace you. And that was a blessing to me uh, to help me to get through school. Uh, because again, like I said, my mom and dad, they really didn't understand about being an artist. How can a child be what it's never seen before? How are you going to do what we've never, we, we know you can sing because we taught you to do that. We know you can cook and you can clean. You might even be able to deliver a baby. <laughs> my mother taught me uh, phlebotomy. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know what phlebotomy is, phlebotomy is uh, one who cuts the veins. So I was basically a professional vampire. That's what I was for 25 years, a professional vampire. I would go to uh, draw blood on um, uh, people with AIDS, um, very sick children, most of them with cancers, um, premature babies that were born, 
uh, women with cancer, mostly breast cancer and ovarian and other types of cancer uh, and uh, geriatrics. I was really good at what I did. Very, very good at what I did. That exposed me to more diversity because uh, the one thing I can tell you for sure is that sickness don't care what color you are. It don't care whether you rich or poor. It does not care whether you, you, you are a movie star or you're just a common person that walks the street. It doesn't care. And so I was exposed to all these wonderful people. Some of them weren't as wonderful, but it taught me so much about diversity uh, to see different people and I would go home and I would just think about the people that I met, the children that I met. Uh, I never thought about children's book illustration at the time. I was just thinking, wow, I got a full-time job and I'm taking care of people and I got awards for drawing blood on people. Uh, that's how good I was. And um, drawing blood on babies, especially sick babies, not a fun thing to do. Uh, but I tried to do it because I didn't want to see the doctors come in and draw blood on the babies. Uh, that wasn't what the doctors needed to do. That was my job. And um, I was walking through the hallway one day and uh, one of the counselors saw me walking through the hallway and she goes, Vanessa, uh, you look sad. What's wrong with you? I said, well, I said, I'm full of reality that uh, life is very short. Uh, death doesn't care what age you are, uh, and it's making me sad. And she said, Vanessa, what do you do for fun? I said, well, you know, I, I do a couple of things, whatever. You, you know, I, I sing in a choir. And she goes, really? Seriously, what do you do for fun? I said, um, I like to draw. So I really like to paint and draw. She said, really? She's like, you know what I want you to do? She said, I want you to get a notebook. And I want you to fill the notebook to overflow with every child and every young person you lost. And I literally looked at her like she was crazy. I said, are you kidding me? You want me to have a heart attack? I said, there's so many babies. She said, I want you to draw every last one of them. And I began to take notebook after notebook after notebook. And sometimes I still get caught up when I think about it. I would take notebook after notebook and I would fill it with every young child, every 25 year old young person that seemed to have their whole life ahead of them. I would draw them. Every baby that I held in my hands, sometimes their feet were so tiny, I felt like they would pop off in my hand. I would be cursed out sometimes by their parents because their parents thought I was doing them harm when I was only there to help. And I would draw every single baby. And before I knew it, I had notebook full of children, full of adults, full of women and men of every culture you could possibly imagine. And I thought to myself then, what's the use? Why am I doing this? I mean, it felt good to get it out, but how is this going to serve me? And I know that some of you probably have gone through some things in your life. Maybe you're adopted. Uh, maybe your dad or your mom died early on. Maybe you were in foster care. I don't know. Maybe you come from a rich family where everything just seems to be beautiful and it's not. I don't know. But uh, to, to see all these wonderful people not know too much about their lives, only that they were sick, and to, and to put them in a book and wondering how it's gonna serve me. I know that sometimes you're probably sitting there wondering how all this stuff is gonna serve you. But uh, if you're a writer out there, if you're an illustrator, we tell stories. Either we tell stories through pictures or we tell stories through words. And uh, in order to tell a really good story, stories have to have some kind of adversity in them and my story had to have its adversity and its adversity was very painful but it serves me and i'm going to tell you how uh continued to work would take some extra money and i would spend it and i would go to sva the school of visual arts in new york where i was taught children's book illustration 
still didn't understand while I was there, you know, because I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do children's book illustration. I want to do fashion. Uh, did As a matter of fact, I did makeup artistry for 25 years. So while I was working as a phlebotomist, I was working also as a makeup artist for major fashion shows and things. But, uh, you know, it still wasn't in my heart to do, you know, th this whole children's book situ situation. My mother and father uh, opened up our doors further and brought in children. Oh yeah, they brought in many children. Most of these children were HIV positive. Black, white, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Muslim, Jewish, you name it, they were, they were living in our home. And I got to see them and it was like having little, it was like having little babies of my own. I got to hold them, I got to read to them, I got to enjoy them. And still not thinking, how's this gonna serve me? This is, you know, uh, kind of narcissistic in a way. <laughs> like, how's this gonna serve me? What is this, what is this for? But I would study them. I would watch them run around. I would watch them fall out and giggle. I would watch them cry. I would, I would watch them just have moments. And not knowing that I was collecting all of this because later in life, I would get married. I would get married, I would get pregnant. I would bury a child who should have been 23 years old come Mother's Day, bury the child. Finally had a, a, a miracle baby named Zoe who will be 21 soon. And uh, I, Marry this awesome guy and he loses his job after 9-11. Our life literally imploded after 9-11. He lost his job. I lost my job. We lost our cars. We lost our home. We lost everything. And I remember sitting in a coal house and I said, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. And it came back to me, hey, you know what? Take a moment, let's draw, let's draw. You can start showing the pictures too while I'm talking. Um, I started drawing and I started putting together a portfolio and I didn't even really know how to do it. All I knew was that I enjoyed talking to my daughter and reading books to her. And so I started studying books. Every book I read to Zoe, I would take it apart. And there was really no more money to go to school. So I had to put myself in my own school. And so I started just studying every piece of artwork, every book I liked and loved as a child. Uh, and I didn't have many of them, but the snowy day was the one that really changed my life. It was the first time that I would ever, 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 ever get to see a brown child as a protagonist in a book. And it was amazing to me. It was, it was everything that I needed. Um, Amanda, you can start showing pictures whenever you'd like. And uh, in seeing the book, I just studied it, broke it down, started making this portfolio and doing a blog about my journey. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna become a children's book illustrator, but I'm just gonna start illustrating whatever I like. Whatever makes me feel good, that's what I'm going to draw. And I began to draw picture after picture after picture. And one day, my living room got filled with artwork. It was everywhere. I mean, on the couch, on the table, it was everywhere. My husband said to me, he said, can you clean off the table so we can eat? I was like, hell, we ain't got no money for food. Why are we cleaning off the table? And he was like, you know, we need to clean off the table. Friend of mine called and said, listen, I'm gonna come over and I wanna spend some time with you. Let's meditate, let's pray. Um, I tried to clean up before she came over. And uh, she walks through the door and she goes, Vanessa, um, who does all this artwork? And I said, me. She said, Vanessa, in all the years I've known you, you never told me that you were an illustrator. I said, um, yeah, I like to draw. She goes, no, you're an illustrator. Mm, uh, you know, I have second thoughts about that. Vanessa, in all the eight years that I've known you, you've never said it that you drew. She said, do you know who I work for? And I was like, no. She said, Vanessa, you don't know who I work for? I said, no. She said, Vanessa, I work for Scholastic Books. You're hired.
Every time I think about it, I just want to burst into tears. Karen Proctor came to my house, saw my dining room table filled with art and said, Vanessa, you're hired. I, I, my mind was so blown. I got to do my first job in a magazine called Read and Rise Magazine. And it was a, a book or a magazine for inner city children who really didn't get a chance to have uh, books about Red Riding Hood or The Three Bears. They had more stories about their real life and what was going on. So it might be a big brother taking care of a little brother or it may be children that are living with their grandparents instead of their, their parents or foster situations, things like that. And so um, I got to work on these kinds of books and uh, I got to pull out the sketchbooks that I was uh, asked to do and told rather prescribed to do. And I filled those books with those children and I gave them a second life. And my heart still gets full because there was one book that I did called Drum City. And there was this beautiful little boy named Ryan. Ryan died of leukemia. And he was the first one that I actually put into a book. And I put him into the story. And every time his parents look at the book, they say, Vanessa, you gave Ryan a second life. Thank you. And they get to turn those pages and every time they do, Ryan lives again. And I've done it so many times. I've created 87 children's books, illustrated over 80, over 87 children's books. Uh, and I've uh, illustrated five of my own and written five of my own. But uh, diversity is what I'm known for. Diversity is also sometimes what I'm not for. Uh, sometimes the white people say I'm too black and the black people say I'm too white. And I look at everybody and I go, what's wrong with y'all? I draw everybody. You want me to pick a side. That's what you want me to do. And I'm never, ever going to pick a side because I'm on the side of the kid. That's it. Uh, racism is something that is taught. Please understand me and hear me. If you don't get anything out of this talk, racism is taught. Okay? children watch everything their parents do from the way you talk about how big your boobies are or how small your little ass is and how you need to have this change and that change and arrange and they listen and they listen good they watch because actions speak louder than words so they see all the things that you do like I said, I work in a hospital for 25 years. I've held every culture of baby because we come from one race. It's only one race, y'all. The human race. That's it. <laughs> one race. Okay. I have never had a baby say, Vanessa, put me down because your arms are too brown. Never happened. Babies want three things. When I poop this diaper out, is there a clean one over there in the corner? Is there a bottle over there with some milk in it or perhaps a booby? I'll take whatever you got. And are your arms and heart strong enough to hold me? That's all they want. We put the rest of the mess out there. And I don't have time to do that anymore. I want to see everybody. When you look at my illustrations, I want you to see everybody because these are people that I know. These are people that I love. These are people that I enjoy. Diversity, I don't have all the answers. I'm not even gonna sit here and try to tell you that I have all the answers. But the one thing you do need to have is an open heart towards people. And it starts with you, not other people. It starts with you. How do you view yourself? How do you see yourself? Some of you I'm talking to right now, your self-esteem is in the toilet because you think you got to be everything to everybody. My hair is too short. My butt is too big. I'm too black. I'm too white. I'm too pale. I'm too short. I'm too tall. All these different things that the world and what we're watching on TV tell us who we need to be instead of us taking the time out to say, I need to breathe. I need to be me. I, I really need you to absorb that because we're in a hell of a time right now. COVID doesn't care whether you're black or white. 
It doesn't care, like I said, of whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't care who you are. It's COVID. That's it. Some of you have probably lost friends and relatives to it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, hear me. I want the attitude of COVID. That I don't really care what color you are, your culture, where you come from. I wanna get to know you. And I get to know you by getting to know myself first. So a lot of this starts with self-love because you know, basically we're hard on people because we're hard on ourselves. <laughs> That's it. We're hard on others because we're struggling with our own selves. And I'm just asking you to take the time to love you, enjoy you, find out and do you. Do you first before you do anybody else. If your mama hasn't said it to you, I'm gonna say it to you. Do you, baby. Do you. You deserve it. You deserve to be appreciated and loved by yourself first. Maybe you don't have a hair parents that showed you diversity, but now your behind has grown. You can get out and you can meet whoever you want to meet. Some of you are not going to marry white people. Some of you are not going to marry black people or Indian or East Indian, American Indian, West Indian. You're not going to marry them. You're going to mix. You might marry somebody who's Asian and start a beautiful family. You might get married and adopt brown children but your heart just needs to be open to diversity however it comes if it's that moment where you just sit and you have tea or you get a chance to paint with your friends whatever it is and however it comes embrace it little bites i'm not asking you to do it overnight some of you have probably never even sat and had dinner with a black person living in this skin that i live in daily it's not easy. It's not easy being brown. Not at all. Very hard. But because I have a heart full of love for people, it's the best gift my mother and father ever gave me was to show me diversity at an early age. That even when I got older and I saw hatred coming at me, I could still move through life, show up and be Vanessa and still be the loving, kind person that I am. And I am, I'm gentle with myself and gentle with others. I care about you. I can't even see all of your faces, but I care about you. Angela, I'm looking at your beautiful face and your beautiful gray hair. I love you. And she doesn't even know me, but you need to know that this is coming from a pure soul I have nothing in my closet to hide, nothing. I love people. I love students. I love students that wanna learn. Uh, I, like I said, don't have all the answers. Uh, we're living in precarious times, but I know this, we need safe places where we can come and ask the deep questions, the hurtful and the scary questions and not be beat up for it. I want to be one of those people who allow you to come and ask the hard question. Diversity is at the heart of everything that I do. I'm going to leave it open just to uh, leave you to ask whatever questions you want. Um, I know I'm all over the place, but I just wanted to really share my heart and spirit with you. I hope I said something to encourage you to live your best life, uh, to find diversity, and to, and to keep sharing it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. So we'll open it up to questions. Um, if you all can type them in the chat, we'll share them. And I'm going to read uh, actually one of my poems okay. while we wait. And this is from my book, um, Just Like Me. This is my first book of poetry that I actually did for children. But it's, you know, while it's, it, I, I really want things to change where we just don't call them children's books, 
because sometimes very hard subjects like diversity and why we need it can be taught through simple books like this. And um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm looking for picture books for adults. Um, me and my sister actually uh, want to do a book called The ABCs of the Breakup. And so it's really what happens when you break up with somebody and all the emotions that you go through, anger, you know, bitterness, you know, um, contemplation, um, distraction, all these different things. And we want to do that for adults. But um, I want to read a poem from Just Like Me uh, for you. And this is my favorite one. It's called I Am a Canvas. I am a canvas being painted on by the words of my family, friends, and community. Sometimes the words are painted with blacks and grays that leave me feeling confused. Other times the palette is filled with blues that make me want to scream and holler in a bluesy kind of way. I'm not feeling it today. And then there are days when pinks and purples flow over my canvas like the sky and give me hope for a different tomorrow. And there, there are paints that I get to choose, greens, yellows, oranges, and blues. Ah, and I have another one that I wanna share with you. And this one is called Mima's Wisdom. Instructions in her voice about right choices. Carrots over candy, water instead of soda, books instead of playing video games, face-to-face -face conversations instead of texting because you can't see someone's soul in a text. And I hear her words as wrinkled hands gently cut my face. All we have is this time, baby girl, making memories that don't need to be backed up or downloaded and just being present. Instructions in her voice, baby girl, make right choices, carrots over candy and keep the good book handy. Watch what you say and don't forget to pray. You'll be a great lady someday if from these instructions you do not stray. And I have one more that I wanna share with you. And it's called Weird. I love me weird and strange. I love my peanut butter sandwiches with jelly beans. I love a good Coca-Cola with peanuts inside. I love to sit behind the living room drapes reading my books and talking to invisible friends about wild adventures. I love the sound of the double dutchers on street corners, the tap, tap, tapping of their feet. I love the smell of mama's black coffee and the strong flavor when I steal a sip. I love the sound of creaky doors and squeaky floors. And I love a good scare. I love my friends who are different from me because that is what a friend is supposed to be. Some are funny, some are cute. All are brilliant and sweet, but they are them and I am me. And if you're weird, then you got a friend in me. And so those are just a few of the poems from this book. Um, I have a lot of diversity going on in here because I wanted to show everyone that we can be different colors of skin on the outside, but a lot of what makes us different makes us the same on the inside. As far as our emotions, what we feel, you know, um, that's why I did this book and I'm, I'm so excited to share it with you all. Thank you, Jill. Thank you so much. Awesome. Vanessa, we have a, I, I have a few questions. Sure. The first, where do you get your mixed media ideas? What mediums do you use? 
I, I use literally everything. I use magic marker. Mostly I paint my own paper. So I'll tell you what I do on a Saturday morning. Um, I get up very, very early, about 4 a.m. in the morning. I put down some newsprint paper on my uh, desk that's in the back of me. Some new newsprint papers. I take out the cheap acrylic paints that you get from like Michaels and Hobby Lobby and all that, I get the, the real cheap ones and then I get the expensive um, golden paints, fluid paints, and I just mix them. And all day long, I will take manila paper and it seems to be the best paper is either newsprint or manila paper. And I paint paper all day long and I start doing the rainbow. I start from red, I move into pinks, and then I move into yellows and oranges. Um, from the oranges, I move into um, other different colors, greens, uh, blues, all of them until I get to black. And um, I just paint papers all day long. And so I collect those as well as far as mixed media. And I use those. Um, I use, uh, this is another thing that I love. I love, I don't know if you can see, but I love this pencil that has all these different colors in it. Um, I use watercolor. Um, black ink, I mix them all together to create the artwork that I uh, do as far as paper is concerned. Uh, but I do use Corel Painter to do my illustrations and I work with Procreate and for um, the Photoshop. So yeah, I work on a lot of stuff. Okay, another question. Where did your inspiration come from for the design of the different children in your book? Uh, studying children. I get to go to schools and I have, you know, I'm very wired very differently. Like I tell you, I am dyslexic, I stutter, and I also um, have synesthesia. And so synesthesia um, causes me to um, see, see color in everything, but uh, I have photogenic memory as well. And so I literally take pictures of people's faces. Um, Melissa will stand out to me because of the style of the, that she wears as a face that I will use probably for a teacher for a book. And so I, uh, when I'm standing in front of the children, I get a chance to look at them and study them. And I take it all in and I take it back to my desk. So I'm around children like, oh, COVID is messing me up where that's concerned because I miss being in front of them and seeing their little faces. Ugh. That's the one thing I do miss. Yeah. And then another, Vanessa, it seems like you have managed to stay connected to the mind of a child. Would you agree? And how much do you think that affects your work? It affects my work 100%. 100%. I am still five years old, y'all. Still five. Uh, where's the next cookie coming from? <laughs> um, can I pull out the Legos and let's play um, and read me a story? Uh, I still, to this day, buy so many children's books because I love reading children's books. Um, I don't really read adult books. I read children's books. They are my favorite but it's I have the heart of a child. And in a lot of ways, when I'm doing children's books, the adults who buy the books, I wanna give not just a child a moment, I wanna give the parents and the teachers who are reading the books to the kids a do-over, if you will. I wanna give you a do-over, you deserve one. You know, um, like I said, my mom and dad didn't have time to really read to my sister and I. So to have moments where I get to illustrate pictures that touch not just the child, but the child's parent and makes the parent go in and like, oh man, that was, that's pretty awesome. I e grandma's purse, the book that I did about my grandma. I can't tell you how many adults I have had walk up to me at signings, burst into tears and tell me you gave me back my grandma. It is something so special. I, I, I love it. I love it. It, it. it touches my heart in a way that I can't even explain. I had one woman walk up to me and she said, um, my husband lost his mother and my mother died right behind uh, uh, his mom. And she said, now my children don't have a grandma. And she said, every time a grandmother book came out or a story about a grandmother, she said, I wouldn't even buy the book. She said, I saw your book and I could not walk past it. She said, I picked it up 
and she's standing there. She's literally crying and both of us are snotting and, and carrying on and she's going, you gave me back my grandma. And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> this is fantastic. This is fantastic. So that five-year-old is still in there. And I just want to give your five-year-old a do-over. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, are any of your individual illustrations available for sale? Yes. A lot of the ones that you have here, like this one is for sale that uh, we have here, diversity. And um, the little boy that's pouring the bottle of fun, if we could uh, just kind of, yes, he's, he's for sale. He's $45. Um, for a nine by 12 and it, they come signed and numbered. They are limited edition. So after we get to a hundred, it will not be available anymore. So if you want it, just inbox me and let me know. Great. So one more, this is a random question. Sure. But is that a snowy day stuffed animal behind you? Yes, it I, is. <laughs> I, ha yeah. says, I happened to notice it and thought it was interesting considering it was one of my favorite books when I was younger. Yes, this is Peter. Mm -hmm. This is my Peter. I, I love him. <laughs> I just got him, actually. Um, I did an interview for another book company, and the guy was so moved by the story that I share about um, uh, Peter. When I was uh, five years old, uh, I went to um, a teacher named Mrs. Russell. Mrs. Russell had the biggest afro I think I'd ever seen in my whole entire life. It was orange. She wore go-go boots. <laughs> and she, 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 she wore these wire rim glasses, round glasses. And she didn't want to embarrass me. She knew that I was dyslexic. And she put me on her lap and she opened up the snow, snowy day. I am 57 years old. And I still remember the pictures. I never remember the words, but I remember the pictures. And it was the first time that I ever saw a brown child beautifully illustrated in the book. And it's why to this day, I still love it. Um, I love myself some Ezra Jack Keats. <laughs> I just think he's amazing. He was the most amazing person that walked the planet. I love him. Uh, one more. You are amazing. What is oh, your? Oh, thank you. What is your best tip for parents who are teaching very young children racial identity? Read books to them about brown children, about children that don't look like them. Read read stories of all children, if possible. Find books that show diversity so that your children get to see it. Uh, you know, if, if they get to see it, um, I, I often say, if they can see themselves, then they can be themselves, then they can free themselves. That's, that's what I say. So please just, just get to reading the books, but um, I will sing a song for you just before we go. Are you ready? We're ready. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed into your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is of a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people that your relatives hate, You've got to be carefully taught. Careful the things you say. 
children do listen. Careful the things you do. Children will see and learn. Children may not uh, obey, but children do listen. Children will look to you for which way to run, to learn what to be. Careful when you say, listen to me. Children will listen to every little word we say. Children will listen. They watch us while we work and play. Children will listen. Children will listen. Children will listen. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Vanessa, thank you so much for spending this time with us this evening. What a terrific evening to be together in celebration of each other. You have been inspiring to each and every one of us. I just know it from the chat. I just like to say a big thank you, you and also to Let's Play Books, our favorite independent bookstore for partnering with us and making your books available for purchase so easily for us. And thank you to everyone who helped facilitate this evening, especially our colleagues in the admissions department here at Cedar Crest. As educators and members of the Cedar Crest community, we are called to be inclusive and celebrate. It is our hope that you have been inspired to share wonderful books which allow every child to be seen and loved. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, everyone, for spending this time with us this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, uh, like, it gives you that on as far as, like, uh, well, it doesn't like it. doesn't um, do that. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. I don't really read that close, but I just find it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. I'm just seeing all of your messages. Thank you all so very, very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, I guess. Um, just, just left.